Hey, welcome to Crossroads Online. Wherever you're watching from, we're glad you're with us. And this week, we're kicking off a great new series called Send It. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians for the series, so grab a Bible and get comfy, and let's get started. And we're so excited again that you're here with us, whether you're here in here with your family, joining us online in the middle of the week, we just want to say hello to you. But listen, we're starting a brand new series called Send It, and it comes at a perfect time as we talk about being a church beyond the walls, because we're going to look over the next few weeks at a book of the Bible called First Thessalonians, and we're going to be looking at this church and how it really is a Send It church. And so if you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians or Acts chapter 17, both of those spots. You could join us there, either that or on the line or on the app, you can look there also. But you might be wondering, you're probably saying, well, Pastor B, what in the world does send it even mean? Like, seems kind of hip and cool, what does it mean? Well, from the extreme sports world is kind of where this, this phrase came from. Our, our friend Jose, who we uh, went out there and videotaped him doing that, he jumps off of rocks and bridges and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, and, and, but before he does it, before he does a gainer or a backflip or whatever he's going to do, he yells, send it. And it's this idea of we're going to go for it. And then he goes for it, he flips and he goes through the air. Now, now send it actually, by definition from the Urban Dictionary, tells us that send it is just do it. To say yes to something. Don't think about it. Have confidence and just send it, it says. So it's this idea of not having fear, going for it. But what I love about this, this phrase, this send it, is that it's transcended the extreme sports world. And now it's kind of everywhere. I heard of somebody that was actually bowling the other day. And one of, her, one of their, their friends is like, just send it, man. And so she hucked the ball down the lane, right? So send it is, is everywhere. So that means that send it is, send it is much less of a mantra and it's more of a, a mental a mindset to embrace. Not just something to say, but it's something to embrace. Send it is a way of living that you don't hold back anything, especially when it comes to your faith in Jesus. So each week what we're going to do is give you a send it challenge for the week. Things that we want you to do as part of the series. First week's going to be super fun. Uh, and no, I don't want you to go jump off a bridge or go jump off a rock. We don't have insurance to cover any of that. So we don't want you to do any of that. But what we want you to do is we want you to take a picture of yourself jumping like you're sending it and then, and then send it in. Uh, example, here's, here's Heather. She's sending it, right? Little Bryn and, and Graham, they're sending it. We got our weird staff. They're sending it, right? So take a picture of yourself midair going for it and just, just do it. Like, do it. I really want you to be a part of this. Then you can either put it on social media, hashtag send it church, or you can also email it to us, send it at crossroadsgrace.org. We're going to take all those pictures in, kind of use them as part of the countdown each week to see how people are doing and what they're interacting with. And there might just be a prize for somebody if we have some really creative stuff happening. So get involved, be part of it, have some fun. We're going to have this Send It Challenge each and every week. So take a look at that for yourself. But Send It is a perfect title for the study of 1 Thessalonians. Because as we press down and we desire to be a Beyond the Walls church... We need to see churches that are doing just that. And in Send It, it's this way of saying loud and proud, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to live out my life, which is why we look at this church in Thessalonica. It's a church that literally was sending it for Jesus at every turn. The author of the book of First Thessalonians is a guy by the name of Paul. We'll talk more about Paul in a second as we go throughout this. But as he begins this letter to these people, he gives them such glowing words and you're going to find out why it was so important. Look at verses 1 through 3 of 1 Thessalonians. 
It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, to, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. He says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts off giving these glowing words to this church and he says, hey, I remember you. And he remembers them for some specific things. He says, I remember your work produced by faith. Let me get this bad boy going here. Or not. Your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. He says, that's what I remember about you. And each and every one of those attributes is part of what a church should be about, a sendit church should be about. And, and whether you believe in God or not here, or you're not even sure about this whole Jesus thing, you probably have seen faith, hope, and love somewhere. It might have been on a coffee cup or an Instagram post or who knows where. You've seen faith, hope, and love. But what I love that Paul does is that he then, he, he, he puts some words with it. Not only is it just faith, hope, and love, but it's, it's work produced by faith. Labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope. Those are motion words, that there's energy put into it, that you see it, there's, there's motion to it, that they get it. This church is a send it church in their faith, their hope, in their love, and in their actions. And because of that, Paul couldn't help but take notice. I mean, literally, he planted all kinds of churches. This is one of the only ones that wasn't screwing something up when he wrote to them. All the other ones were jacking something up, and he was like, no, 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 you're doing something good. But what were they doing? What were they doing that was right? More importantly, you probably are asking, what does it have to do anything with me? Pastor B, that's great. That's kind of cute stuff. But what does it have to do with me? Well, I'm going to tell you something. That what they're doing has everything to do with you and with us. Because what we see this church doing is what we need to be trying to do in every aspect of our lives. They are passionate. They're a young church. They're, a, they're sold out for Jesus. But yet at every turn, despite the persecution they're going through, they are sending it for Jesus. No matter what happens day in and day out, they are for Jesus. Except I realize that when we talk about things like this, it can get a little nerve wracking. You can get a little nervous and you're not even sure. I mean, even Jose would tell you that there's some times where he gets to the edge of a cliff and he's like, can I do it? Should I do it? I've got a, I've got a young wife and, a young, and young kids at home. This probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Should I do it? And sometimes they'll take a step back. And, and I know for you, sometimes you're thinking that same thing. You get to that edge of the cliff and you're like, when it comes to your faith and you're like, oh, can I do it? Can I have faith despite what all my coworkers are telling me at work? Uh, can, can I have faith? Can I go for it? Even, even, even though like, I, I know what that means as far as my relationships are concerned. I mean, can I, can I go for it even though God says I need to be generous? Can I, can I send it? And, and, and sometimes that'll make your knees knock and you get a little nervous when it comes to things like that. And listen, I am not immune to that at all. And no, you're probably thinking, well, you're the pastor. Shouldn't you be the king of send it? You should be the faith guy, right? I'd love to be able to be that for you, but I don't always have that kind of faith. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. There are more times than not that when I'm in a plane, I am praying. I'm not praying for somebody to sit next to me that I can share Jesus with. I'm not, right? I'm praying, God, have no one sit next to me so I don't have to play elbow MMA with the armrest. I, it's just honest. That's the goodness. I don't want it. And then there's some times that I've, I've had all kinds of stuff. that Because faith can be scary. Moving out here was one of the scariest things I ever did for me and my family. We had a place that we loved. We had a church that we loved. We had a, I had a job that I loved. We had friends. We had all kinds of stuff out there. So God says, hey, move to this place you've never been, to a church that you've never been with a bunch of strange people like you. What? Like, what am I supposed to say, right? I mean, look around. You're a little strange. It can be a little scary sometimes. It's okay. And then when I took a twenty dollars or $30,000 pay cut to go from the business world to ministry and then had to call my mom and tell her what I just did, <laughs> that was dicey a little bit, you know? And then I became a parent. And virtually every day of my life is a, is a cliff moment of faith. Because I am so scared I'm going to jack those kids up. And the, the counseling bills are going to be so high. I understand, right? So I get it when you, when you have this moment. But Jesus, every time that that happens, he's saying, hey, do you trust me? Do, do you trust me? And the answer to that question will determine whether our knees shake and we move away from the edge 
or we say, I trust you, and, and we send it for Jesus, having no doubt that Jesus is going to be with us every step of the way. And so what we see in 1 Thessalonians is an amazing example of bold faith of conviction, of commitment towards Jesus, not just for themselves, but also for the entire world. And so our prayer is this, is that as we go through this together, this Send It series, that more and more people would stop moving away from the edge of faith and more people would just go for it. That they would go for it in every area of their life and they would, and, and I just know that when that happens, your life will change, my life will change, the church will change, and then the valley will change. Because of us saying we're going to send it. But before we get too far into 1 Thessalonians, I think it's important to understand the context of kind of what's there a, a little bit. Um, and, and for you, you're like, oh, man, I don't really care about this. But you do more than you think. Let me give you a, vis- a little illustration. My, my daughter, Anison, she's a dancer. And she is in the Nutcracker performance at the Gallo every year. Maybe you've been to that before. It's through Central West Ballet. And I have no idea what she does, but she loves it. And so it's, it's awesome, right? So she's super excited. She had a tryout just yesterday for a big part in it. So she's all excited about that. Uh, but but in, that, in that moment, not only does she get to be in the Nutcracker Ballet, but then they also get free labor from the parents as a part of being a part of it. <laughs> parents, you get this, right? You, get, you sign your kid up for baseball, but it's not just that. Your son plays baseball and you work in the snack shack for about a billion years, right? That's what you get. Or, or you sign your daughter up for volleyball. It's not just for volleyball. You get to sign up to sell popcorn no one wants to buy, okay? You can put gourmet on it and nobody still want it. But that's what you do. You're, you're required to do that because you love your kids, right? So you do that. Now, now, my responsibility, free grunt labor, is my job is that I go to Central West Ballet and I get to pack up all of the, the stage stuff, the, the sets and the scenes and stuff, and I shove them into a U-Haul and then we shut the door and then it goes to the gallop. And I, every year, I'm, I'm looking, I'm putting this stuff in there. It's like, it's, a, it's the weirdest junk that you put in there. Like, it just looks like, it's like wood and, and metal and styrofoams and broken dreams, like all put in this thing. <laughs> and then you shove it in and it goes away. And you're like, that is not very good looking at all, you know? I think, I, you see of the beauty, the ballet and everything that's happening. You're like, that doesn't match any of that. But then opening night comes. The curtains open. And there you see all the sets together. And then you realize, now I get it. Because it transports you to a different time, a different place that you couldn't do just by saying, this is where we're at. It it, it accentuates all the dancing that's happened and the emotion that comes out of that is because of the, the background of it. And so as much as it is important for a ballet, it's also very important for us when it comes to the scripture. So we need to understand the backdrop that's there when it comes to 1 Thessalonians, to understand how profoundly amazing this church really, really is. To transport us back to what was really happening. Because 1 Thessalonians is one of Paul's first letters he ever wrote. It's, it's dated back to A.D. 50 is when it's, it was written. Which should tell you that that makes the Bible very, very accurate. Because so many people say, oh, the Bible was written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus was, was, was dead. No, man, it's like, this is a couple decades that we're talking about. So it's a very reliable, reliable book, and you should be able to trust it for that. Paul planted this church in the, in the city of Thessalonica. Its original name was Therma, because it was known for all the hot springs that were in that city. And, and interestingly enough, it was actually captured by the Romans. And once the Romans captured the city, it became the, the capital of that province. And it was about 200,000 people lived there. And it was an influential city. Lots of people would come there and do business there and trade there. And so it was one, and it's also one of the few New Testament cities you could still visit if you wanted to go there today. But because of this diversity, it also created a lot of challenges for this new church. Because with new ideas that were coming in, like if he, Paul bringing in Jesus into the city would have met with a lot of opposition. Because there was a lot of Jewish people that were there and other religions there. And so anything that was against them, they didn't like that. But it was a very important thing to be able to plant that church where it was at. But we get to read about how the church actually began back in Acts chapter 17. It tells us all about it. Uh, chapter, one of cha- or chapter 17, verse 1 says... When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. 
As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So I'm the kind of guy that likes to know the inner workings of things. Like I like documentaries. I like to know the belly of how things work. And I love to be able to read here what, what, what Paul does when he plants this church. It's part of the reason I love the Thessalonica story, the Thessalonian story. Because sometimes I think that we think of church planters as like these wanderers back in the day that were just like weirdos and wandering around. Ah, we'll plant a church here. It wasn't really how it went. I mean, there was much more strategy that went with it. And we just read about what Paul did. Paul would go into cities, he would find a synagogue, which was a church, he'd guest preach for three weekends in a row, and then based on their response to the gospel, what he was telling them about Jesus, he would decide whether or not there was enough there to plant a church. And based on what he preached, he was able to plant this church at Thessalonica. So he's very strategic in it, and he knew that Thessalonica was really important. As, as hard as it was to plant there, it was also really important to plant there because of how hard it was. Because of the diversity of thought that was there, the different people that were coming in and all those different things, they were coming from different areas. It was important to plant a church there because then they could take the gospel back to where they came from and the gospel, the message of Jesus actually spreads faster. So this is why Paul wasn't afraid to be a missionary in really hard places like this city. But guys, listen, we get this in California all the time. It's hard some days to be a Christian In this state, and it can present all kinds of challenges to our families and to us as individuals, and it can make us want to tap out. But I just wonder if we could take a step back and see this world as Jesus sees it. That he might very well be saying, You are in the middle of a Thessalonica situation right now, and I need you to be right where you're at, in the middle of the mess. In the middle of the hardship, in the middle of the craziness, I need you to be Jesus right where you're at. So don't bail on the mission. Stand firm. Make a difference for Jesus. And if you're watching this online in the middle of the week for like my friend Shay in Canada or any number of my friends in in Illinois, you know right now that God has you where you're at for a reason. And God is telling you and he's telling us that I want you to stay where you're at. I want you to send it for my glory I want you to send it for him. Don't be afraid because I got you is what Jesus is saying. He's saying hang tight. And when we can do this and how we can do this is because of what Paul really tells this church the first thing right out of the gate. To this great church, he tells them one thing. Not He doesn't start with his frustration or instruction or anything about persecution. No, what he starts with is that what I'm hearing that you're doing more than anything else is that you're keeping the gospel of Jesus the main thing. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3 again. We remember before our God and Father, work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is so important for us to remember. And what it means for us is that before we do anything, we must understand the someone in Jesus Christ. We can't just say, oh, I know of him. No, no, you need to know him personally. And guess what? When you become a follower of Jesus, you are not going to get a discount to Jamba Juice. Like it doesn't come with any of that. It's not going to happen, right? That's not what happens. But God does say, I'm going to give you something. And what he says he's going to give us is the power of God himself. Paul would say this in verse 5. He'd say, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. He said there's there's, there's power and there's conviction in what we're giving you. Power and conviction. Now, conviction is an interesting word in the Greek. It's the word pleroforia. Pleroforia. It means complete or full. You'll see the same word in Colossians 2, verses 2 through 3. It's the idea of the fullness of God, the completeness of God. There's this conviction that's within us. Pleroforia. But then he also uses the word power. And the word power in the Greek is the word dynamē, And it means powerful. So let's see how you are, class. And online you'll probably get this. Dynamē, you get the word dynamite from. That's where dynamite comes from. Because there's power in there. But let's understand something a little closer. What does it mean? You might be asking yourself, what does it mean to have conviction for Jesus? Like what does that even mean? 
let me give you an example. And this is a fictitious example, not real at all in any stretch of the imagination. If you're, here, if you're a teacher here today, I'm not talking about anything real. Okay, disclaimer, we're good. Here's the story. Let's say that we're all parents. And we decide that we're going to go to, we, we need to go to our, our, our kids' uh, conferences. And we go to sit down with the teacher. And, and they sit across and we ask, like, hey, how's our, how's our little boy doing? And the teacher looks across from you and says, well, i got to be honest. Your son is terrible. Like, he is the worst ever. He can't read. He can't write. He's terrible to his kids. He is literally the worst human being I've ever worked with in my life. I don't ever want him to come back to class. I think you should stay away from all humanity. He is a terrible, terrible, terrible little boy. Did I mention he is terrible? He says that. Now, let's ask ourselves, would there be any sort of conviction inside us to what that person just told us, right? If you're a parent, if I'm that parent, I will have a conviction from what she just told me is what I'm just, right? I'm going to let you know. Because right now inside you, even though it's not real, you're feeling this thing inside you bubble up, aren't you? It's starting right about here and it's starting to come up and you're going to give them a little conviction back about your child. Am I right? You're going to let them know. Why? Because that's my boy. I know my son. I know what he's capable of. I know his potential. So don't you go and tell me that my son is this and that. I'll tell you what my son is because I've got conviction, right? I've got conviction. Prero foria, just coming all up out of me, right? You know, just saying, this is what it is. Now, now, now keeping that idea, that, that this, this gut feeling that you have, that you feel it right now, let me ask you this question. When, when you think about this, do you feel the same sort of, uh, the same sort of conviction come up when someone says something about Jesus? No, no, do, do, do you have that? Do, do you have that? Do you say, no, 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 that, that's my Jesus. You're not saying that about my Jesus. No, 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 no. No, let me tell you the truth about who he really is. Do you have this platophoria that's coming up within you that just says, no, 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 that's my Jesus. Do you have conviction or do you have hesitation when it comes to Jesus? Would you stand up for him in a crowd or are you a wallflower on the side of the wall for Jesus? And all of us probably in the room are like, oh, you, you bet I got conviction for Jesus. Until push comes to shove. Do you have conviction or do you have hesitation? See, we have conviction that we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I've got conviction about Jesus saving me from my sins. I'm all about that. But I have hesitations about him dealing with any other part of my life. I, I've got convictions coming up for me when I'm in the middle of a mess. Oh, you bet. I love me some Jesus when that's happening. But I've got some hesitations when you start to tell me how to spend my money. Oh, I've got some convictions when it comes to Jesus about getting into heaven, all about that. But when you start telling me, oh, I've got some hesitations when you tell me about what I can and can't do with my boyfriend. See, 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 conviction and hesitation is different. Paul says there's a conviction about the gospel, but you cannot have a hesitation. And he says that because he knows that there is power in the gospel. But knowing about the power, knowing about the dynamite, and using it are two different things. I, I could hold the stick of dynamite here all day and going to do nothing until I light that fuse. And when I light that fuse, then when everything that was inside of it starts to explode and it does what it was designed for. So the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of the power of God, does you no good unless you use it. Which is why we see the proof that Jesus had taken hold in this church was because he said it's not because of your words, it's because of your actions. Paul says this in verse 6. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. He says, you all have become imitators, not imitations, not, not a fake Rolex, not a fake, you know, imitation crab version. No, no, no. You have become imitators. You are authentic. You are following Jesus. You are, and not only this, not only are you showing it to each other, but you're showing it to much, much more people that are around you you'll ever know. Guys, this is why I think one of the greatest sins that can be con 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 conducted by a Christian is this. It's knowing the power of Jesus and yet never telling anyone about it or doing anything with it. It is holding the stick of dynamite, expecting it to do something and never lighting the wick. Guys, I really believe this. And, and here's why. Listen to what Paul says in Romans, actually. Romans chapter 10, 
Start in verse 9 with me. It says this. It's Paul speaking again. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To which all of us that believe in Jesus say with that same thing. Amen. Amen. Pastor, I believe in that. Absolutely, I believe in that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that believe in their heart, speak with their mouth, believe in Jesus with everything that they have. That's what I'm talking about. That saved a wretch like me. I'm all for that. Read that again, Pastor. Read it again. And so we say that because that's the gospel. That's the gospel message. But here's the problem. If you stop reading, you miss the whole point of what Paul just said. Keep going. He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Listen, you know what he just said right there? He says this. He says, if you want to have ascended faith, you really want it, then you need to be ready to live. You better live it out. And you better be ready to give an account for it. And you better be willing to be proud of what you believe. Believe that that the pleroforia, that conviction that bubbles up inside you. Because the world we live in wants to believe what it wants to believe and live how it wants to live. And the message of Jesus is more important than ever before because of that. Because listen to me, at some point, the futility of the cultural fog that is around our culture is either going to become so oppressive that people are going to look around for hope or it might just lift up just enough that you could see underneath it and say, ooh, there's something over there. But if there's no one there to tell them about it, the fog will consume them again. We know people like that. So he says, and Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah right here, he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now let me tell you something. The reason I love this is because when these two cats wrote that, there were, there were no good feet everywhere. No beautiful feet happening anywhere. There were no pedicures. There were no weird foot massages. There were no those things at the kiosk where you put them in and the fish eat all the stuff off the bottom. You ever seen those things? Crazy eating stuff off the bottom, right? There was none of that. No, no, there was just nasty sandal feet, poop on the bottom, dirt everywhere, smelling stanky. Like, that's what it was. But what Paul and Isaiah had the audacity to say, these are some beautiful feet that are bringing things to me. Beautiful feet. How can you call what they have as beautiful feet? Here's why. Because they were beautiful because they weren't smooth and they had the rough, rugged road of life all over them. Their story was beautiful, he said. Your story is beautiful. Your, no matter how vanilla it might be or supreme pizza with a side of garlic knots, your story might be, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful story, but it is up to your feet to take it where it needs to be heard. That's what he's saying. So listen, y'all, it's up to us whether we're going to use what God has given or not. Because the ripple effects of your story are going to make huge differences beyond what you could ever see. Paul says in verse 7 and 8, back to 1 Thessalonians, he says this. He says, and so you became, speaking of this church, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known Everywhere, he says. Everywhere. He says, y'all have become the gold standard for send it. Macedonia to Achaia, about 184 miles. Macedonia to uh, Thessalonica, about 92 miles. That that, that doesn't seem that far to us, but in those times, that might have been another planet. If Paul's saying, listen, y'all, everybody's hearing about you. Everyone is hearing about you. You're becoming inspirational, and your love of Jesus is infectious. Oh my goodness, I just wonder what it would be like for someone to say about you or about me those things. What would it be like, my friends, if the first thing someone thought about you was, man, they love Jesus. Man, look at their faith. Would you just look at how they're dealing with difficult times? 
They have that hard time in their marriage, but man, that Jesus is doing something in them. They spend money like crazy on things that I would never spend. My, but look at how joyful they are. What would it be like for the world to look at you and say, Jesus? Yes. Now, that's my prayer for this church more than anything else. Where somebody to put a microphone in front of you and say, hey, what changed your life? It would not be Crossroads Grace Christian Church. It would be Jesus. That's what the most important thing is. The most important thing is. He says, listen, if you want to know, then you need to know Jesus. You need to know Jesus. And he's saying, y'all, people are hearing about it. They're hearing about it all over the place. Look in verse 8. It says, therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Don't you love the detail there? Paul says, I don't need to come and visit you because everybody's telling me about you. They're saying, hey, that church at Thessalonica, they're like running from idols and they're embracing Jesus. Like they're, doing all, they're, they're like taking care of people and they're doing the things they're supposed to do. I'm like, hey, Paul, you just need to know they're crushing it over there. So Paul says, that's, that's what I want to hear. That's my church. That's a send it church that not only understands the dynamo that's within them, but that actually is accessing it. That the power of God is doing something profound in their life. So what we learn is that if we really want to step off the cliff and dive into this thing called faith, we need the gospel of Jesus first. There is no sense of jumping off a bridge or a, a cliff or whatever if you don't know what's underneath. There's no sense. No normal person would do that. But people will tell you. If you're going to be a Christian, you've got to just have blind faith, jump off, and good luck. That's what they'll say. They'll say, faith is for the weak-minded is what they'll say. No, it's not. Faith is about when your head and your heart and your soul all come to the realization that what God said is true is true. That Jesus loves us. That he actually came and died for our sins in our place. That the gospel is real and it's there. But following Jesus is about understanding that we at some point have to take that step of faith. But knowing this, my friends, listen to me very carefully. When we think about this idea of our faith, you need to know something. Jesus jumped first. Yes, he did. Jesus jumped first. See, we, we, for, we forget that. That in the middle of the mess, God sent perfection into imperfection to save the imperfect in you and me. That that's where the gospel message is. So Jesus jumped first for us. So that when we get to the edge of our faith, we're not, sit, we're not looking down at a, an impossible dive that we don't know the end of it. No, we're diving into the arms of Jesus and saying, I got you. Come on. Come on. So we think of it the wrong way. We think of it as this huge chasm that we could never even know the end of it. And without Jesus, that's true. But with Jesus, since he jumped first, he's like, I got you. It's only a couple of inches, baby. Come on in. I got you. And when we know that, we start to understand something pretty profound. That faith is taking a leap knowing the love of Jesus will catch you. It will catch you. So I don't know what you're going up against here today. And I know in a room this size, and I know people that are watching right now, you are up against the cliff and you're wondering, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can have that much faith. I don't know. And the problem is you're seeing it with the wrong eyes. You're looking at it as though there was no end in sight. And when Jesus is saying is, the end is right here. Just come. Come to me. Take your jump. And it's so amazing that when you do that, you think, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. And then you're like, oh, that wasn't bad. Because Jesus is there and his love will catch you. So, my friends, that's what it looks like to be ascended, have someone with ascended faith. It's somebody that just believes that Jesus is right there and I trust him. I'm willing to give everything to him. I'm willing to send it for him. And when that happens, your life changes forever in all the right ways. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you as people at the edge of a cliff. Some of us in our lives are wondering about decisions we need to make. It might be about job stuff or marriage stuff or relationship stuff or parenting stuff might be about getting involved in the church. It might be all kinds of different things, Father. Who knows? But, Father, we come to this edge of this cliff called faith. And too often we ignore the fact that Jesus is right there and we just look to the endless abyss that might be next to him. 
But might we refocus ourselves back to Jesus who says, I got you. Just jump, I got you. My love will catch you. Help us to do that because when we do that, then our eternities are completely different. God, if there's anyone here today that has never received this gospel message, might they hear these words today? That if they believe with their heart and they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, they will be saved. They simply have to say, God, I'm a sinner and I'm apart from you. My entire life I've been running from you and I am filled with so much emptiness that I'm scared. But today I realize that Jesus jumped first and that at the bottom of all that I'm scared about is Jesus with his hands open saying, I got you. And so today I jump into his arms and I say, thank you, Father. I'm now yours. Your scripture tells us that the old's gone, the new's come because of Christ. And because of that, our lives are now different forever. I pray that we can understand that in our heads, in our hearts, in our souls, and that we can know that having a faith that is ascendant faith is the best life ever lived because it's in the arms of Jesus. Help us now as we believe that the better things are yet to come. As we stand in front of you and we worship you, may this really mean something and take us into this world that we live. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us online this week. We'd love to have you join us on campus if you can, but feel free to check out our website at crossroadsgrace.org or download our free Crossroads Grace app. These are great ways to connect with a member of our staff, find out what's going on around campus, or to give if you feel led. You can also catch up on all the other weeks if you missed any. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you have a great week.